Well, good morning. I hope you all are well today. You're excited to be here today as we come together to uh, worship our Lord. And uh, as we get ready to get started this morning, if you have a bulletin, you can follow along with a few of the announcements. You will notice on the inside of your bulletin our schedule for tonight and also our catechism, which we will come back to shortly. On the back of your bulletin, you will notice, I guess I should also mention while we're on the inside of the bulletin, uh, thank you for worshiping with us today. If you're visiting, would like to fill out a visitor card. They are in the booth. On the back of your bulletin, you will notice a special thank you from me to you all for the number of words of encouragement, cards, calls, things said to me during Pastor Appreciation Month. I really appreciate it. But I always say, I really do feel like the one who's blessed, my family does. We love serving here. We love you guys. What a family you are to us. And we're thankful to you. Thanksgiving cards. On the table outside the sanctuary, there are Thanksgiving cards to our shut-ins. If you would just take a minute on your way out to sign those cards to let our shut-ins know that we're praying for them and uh, thinking of them during this Thanksgiving season. And then there are Thanksgiving baskets for five families uh, being put together. And so here's what we still need left. If you look there on your list, you'll see uh, we need a little bit of several things. So if you can provide uh, some of those things and bring them in next Sunday morning, we would really appreciate that and uh, know that they will go to uh, bless families this Thanksgiving season. And I guess we have two weeks. I said by next week, but actually we have two weeks. The 21st is when all that needs to be back in by. Then if you look at the bottom of your bulletin, there's a reminder for the Women's Bible Study on Tuesdays at 1.15 in the Five Books of Moses, a very important study paralleling what we're going through in Hebrews. And then lastly, shoe boxes are due back next Sunday morning, November the 14th. And there are still a few boxes on the table outside the office. If you go up the ramp here outside, you, you'll find them there if you still need a box. And I think that's it. One final reminder, you'll notice our good friends the Thompsons are not here. Uh, Ben's grandfather passed away, uh, Kenneth Kiker. And so that service is tonight at 7 o'clock at Antioch, uh, if any of you want to attend. But just be praying for the family. Uh, they knew for the last couple of weeks that this was coming. Um, and they're holding on to the promises that we have in Christ. And those are incredible blessings in times like this. But it still hurts to lose ones we love. And so keep Ben in your prayers, his family in your prayers and, uh, and their entire family. With that, let's turn to our psalm, Psalm 75. And this psalm is ascribed to the chief musician, set to Do Not Destroy, a psalm of Asaph, a song. We give thanks to you, O God. We give thanks for your wondrous work declare that your name is near. When I choose the proper time, I will judge uprightly. The earth and all its inhabitants are dissolved. I set up its pillars firmly, Selah. I said to the boastful, do not deal boastfully. And to the wicked, do not lift up the horn. Do not lift up your horn on high. Do not speak with a stiff neck. For exaltation comes neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But God is the judge. He puts down one and exalts another. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red. It is fully mixed, and he pours it out. Surely its dregs shall all the wicked of the earth drain and drink down. But I will declare forever. I will sing praises to the God of Jacob. All the horns of the wicked I will also cut off. But the horns of the righteous shall be exalted. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we are thankful to be here together worshiping this morning on this beautiful day. It's a, a cold morning, but beautiful sunshine comes in through these windows, Father. And we are thankful, Father, that we can come together in this place for worship today. And so, Father, help us to do that. Help us to lift high the name of Christ. Help us, Father, to sing together as a people united by our love and faith in Christ. Help us, Father, to uh, greet one another with loving kindness as we are called to be a people who love one another as you have loved us. Father, help us be a people who worship in all the ways that we gather to worship, whether it's in singing, fellowshipping, praying together, 
whether it's in our giving together or whether it's in our sitting under your word together. And Father, all these things we, prepare, we pray would prepare our hearts for the time where we come to your word. Speak to us, we pray, through your word. Let us hear not the words of men which are here today and gone tomorrow, but let us hear your everlasting, eternal, perfect words. Father, speak to us through your word. Speak to us through this warning given to us in the text of Scripture. We pray, Father, today that you would be with all those in our church that are um, dealing with difficulties. We pray for Ben this morning and his family as uh, they're dealing with uh, losing a, a loved one. But, Father, we know that in Christ there is no loss. We know in Christ Jesus we have life eternal. And so, Father, we thank you for the life of Brother Kenneth Kiker, his half-century of faithful ministry. We thank you for his love of Jesus, and we thank you today that he is in your presence. The same hope that we all cling to, that in Christ Jesus we will forever be with you. So, Father, give us reason to sing this morning, for that is reason to sing. Help us, Father, to lift high the name of Jesus, in whom we have life. It's in his name we gather and pray, and for his glory, amen. Good morning. If you would, please stand as we sing our opening hymn this morning, hymn 326, Come Thou Almighty King, and we will sing all four verses of hymn 326. We will sing Arise My Soul Arise as our offertory hymn, and we will sing all four verses of hymn 291. B. 
Let us pray. Father, again, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us. We thank you for these wonderful brothers and sisters with whom we are gathered this morning to praise the name of Jesus. And Father, we thank you for these great songs that we're able to sing that remind us of the great truths of the Christian faith and the confidence that we can have in Christ. Father, as we come to the time of the service where we give back a portion of the blessings we've received from your hand, we ask that you give us giving hearts. We pray, Father, that you'd give us eyes to see the work ahead, the need for uh, missions not only in our church and in our community, but around the world. Father, help us to recognize that uh, we have been a blessed people, that you provided for our needs, that every good and perfect gift that we have has come from you. And so, Father, we ask that you give us giving hearts that we might return a portion of that blessing, that it might be used for your work in this world to bring the name of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth. It's in Christ's name we make this prayer and for his glory. Amen. If you have your bulletin, we come now to our time of catechism, and it's found inside your bulletin as we continue through Spurgeon's Puritan Catechism. And we'll do it as we usually do. We will together, I'll read the question, and then we'll together answer the question. We come to question 78. How is baptism rightly administered? The answer, baptism is rightly administered by immersion or dipping the whole body of the person in water in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit according to Christ's institution and the practice of the apostles, and not by sprinkling or pouring of water or dipping some part of the body after the tradition of men. All right, we come now to our text for today. 
And let me turn just a couple of pages to the right place. It's found in chapter 3, and we're going to read. We're going to be looking at 14, but we're going to be reading for a moment 12 through 15. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is still called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said, today, if you will hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Now, uh, at this time, I want to uh, have a prayer. Uh, As you may know, today is the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. And we want to remember that we have brothers and sisters around the world who suffer persecution on a daily basis for their walk in Christ, for doing essentially the same thing we're doing here today, worshiping our King. And so we want to pray with, for them today. Father, today we come before you with thanksgiving to know that we have brothers and sisters in Christ around the world. And we know that many of them are meeting in places where they have the freedom to meet, Father. But many are meeting uh, in countries and in places where it is dangerous. In places where if they are caught, they will be arrested, they will be fined or worse, imprisoned. And so, Father, we lift them up today. We remember in your word that we are called to remember the prisoners as if chained with them. And so, Father, help us always to remember our brothers and sisters who are suffering in their gospel calling and work, suffering for the name of Jesus Christ. Let us not forget them, but be thankful for the example they set of faithfulness and endurance in the faith. And Father, let us follow their example and be a people who are faithful to you, recognizing that if we aren't suffering persecution, we may one day be. And so as we would want those to pray for us, uh, Father, we ask that we remember to pray for them. So Father, we lift them up this morning. We remember them as if we ourselves are chained with them. Father, bless them, encourage them, Help them to faithfully follow you and witness on behalf of Christ Jesus, our King. It's in his name we make this prayer. Amen. If you would, please stand as we sing our next hymn, Hymn 405, Not in Me, and we will sing all three verses of Hymn 405. Amen. 
you may be seated. We come now to our message, and it is found in Hebrews chapter 3, where we read just a moment ago. And as you're turning there, uh, we're doing something a little different this morning in that we're trying to focus on the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church by looking at something that's written in this text that we've been looking at. And so uh, there won't be a lot particularly new, but it's just asking you to think about what is said here and how it relates to the idea of persecution and particularly persevering through persecution and how we do that. Because at the heart of the message in Hebrews is persevere. Hold fast the faith that you claim to have received when you first believed. And so we want to look for a moment at this text and think about it. So if you're turning to Hebrews chapter 3, we want to uh, think about for a moment how this letter is written against the backdrop of persecution. The very thing that we're talking about. In fact, as I was thinking about what to do this week, I thought a little bit about maybe going somewhere different as we sometimes do on, on days like this. And I thought about, well, we could go back to First and Second Thessalonians, you know, those were letters written against a backdrop of persecution. But in fact, a good chunk of the New Testament was written against the backdrop of persecution. And so I thought, why don't we just stay here and look at this verse 14, which is an important verse, and we can think about it. Now, how does this chapter begin? Rather than recap the entire letter, we've been going through this letter since Easter. Um, how can we think about chapter 3? Well, it begins with a comparison and contrast between Jesus and Moses. And it makes the point that there was much to be said about Moses, wasn't there? Moses was a faithful servant. In fact, he was a servant in all the house of God. And we looked at how that had been said uh, in the books of Moses. And we thought about how it says that he was a, a great man of faithfulness to God from among the people of God. But that isn't quite like Christ, is it? In some ways it is. Christ was a great deliverer, as Moses was. He was sent on a mission by God, as Moses was. But there are differences. Moses is a servant. Christ is Lord. Moses served in God's house amongst the people of God. Christ sits at the right hand of the Father, ruling and reigning over His people. So there are some differences. And so in that way, he says that Christ is of greater glory, right? Worthy of more glory than Moses. There is no question about that. Any Christian would acknowledge that. But this letter is written in the backdrop of a people who, having claimed to know that, claimed to believe that, claimed to have held fast to it for a time, now say, we're going to go back to the synagogue. A people who came out of the synagogue recognized Christ as the fulfillment of all those Old Testament truths. They said they trusted in Him, and now they say, we're going to go back to the synagogue. Why? Why would they do that? Well, the answer is simple, persecution. Persecution. My friends, persecution is something that will make you think about where you stand. We have to recognize that it will make you think about where you stand. And so uh, this chapter is really framed around Psalm 95. It's a reminder in David's day, David wrote Psalm 95, saying to his people who had seen the mighty workings of God, he said, you've seen the glory of God and the working of God in your midst Beware. Beware. Because I can tell you, David said, another generation that had had the same blessing. The generation that Moses led in the wilderness. They had seen the working of God, the might of God. They had seen the power of God, the miracles of God. They had seen evidence of God's presence over and over again. And yet, rather than being driven into worship of a holy and righteous God who had delivered them, they rebelled in unrighteousness. David is saying in Psalm 95, beware, we've seen many glorious things. God has delivered us. He's unified our nation. He's given us rest from our enemies. Beware, now is the time to worship God. But this is also where the danger is. Because we can get comfortable and we can relax. And then what can happen is we, like them, fall in sin and unbelief. Now, we want to think about how this Scripture is telling us to think about this, but this author is saying to his generation, you're in the same exact position. You're a generation that have heard the mighty workings of God, seen the mighty workings of God. You heard the gospel proclaimed, accompanied by miraculous signs and wonders, such that you claimed 
to have believed this is the truth. And yet something has happened, as it did in the days of Moses and in the days of David, and it's happening again in their day, a danger, a danger, a danger of loss. And so again, we want to ask ourselves what this text is warning David's generation that they're building on in Psalm 95, the author of Hebrews' generation, and I believe it's a warning to our generation as well. And so I want to focus on primarily 14, a little bit 12 and 13, and we've already read 12 through 15. So I'm going to read 12 through 14, and that'll get us where we're really wanting to go. Beware, brethren, let there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ, if we hold fast the beginning of our confidence, steadfast to the end. Now there are two main points we want to look at here this morning. First of all, the threat of persecution. And that is a big theme we're building on today because of it being the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. The threat of persecution. And second of all, the triumph of perseverance. The author wants us to recognize something as we think about persecution and the threat it brings that those who are truly in Christ can have a confidence facing persecution uh, that those outside of faith in Christ will not have. And so we want to look at that this morning. So we want to begin with the very thing that we're talking about today, which is the threat of persecution. We want to think about it because this is leading some in this text, in the, the history that is behind the text we're reading, This letter is dealing with some who had professed Christ to say, maybe we don't want to profess Christ anymore. Some who had said, we are Christians, we are uh, amongst the people of God to say, now maybe we'll go back to the synagogue. Now why would they do that? Well, it's clear, isn't it? The threat of persecution, we've been talking about that. It's not a small threat. It's a great threat. It's a real threat. And if we don't think it is, it's because we ourselves haven't faced it. And as we begin to face little inklings of it in our own land, we recognize it can make you uncomfortable. But my friends, this is nothing compared to what our brothers and sisters face even today in the world, but have faced throughout the history of the church. In fact, we would say that what we have been privileged to be in, and sometimes I wonder if it is a privilege because it's made a church that is lax, a church that is not dedicated. You know, where there is persecution, the people of God know where they stand. Right? Now, it doesn't mean that we should desire persecution, but it does mean there is something persecution does. It refines the church. It refines the church. And so again, what does it bring? It brings the risk of loss. Loss of property on the easier end. Loss of freedom. Loss of life. It can bring all those things. And so these things are faced by brothers and sisters around the world and throughout the history of the church. In fact, as I was trying to say a moment ago, I think persecution being faced by the church is the norm, right? We've kind of had the the thing that's not normal. Persecution has been normal. In fact, uh, as we've been going through Matthew's gospel, Jesus warned us that it would be the norm. Don't be surprised, he was saying, when they persecute you. The servant is not greater than the master. They persecuted me. They're going to persecute you. And so again, we see this pattern, we see uh, this reality. And I was looking uh, today, Voice of the Martyrs listed, there are 60 nations that are either hostile uh, to the gospel or restrictive of work, the work of the church. Now, 41 countries have laws against gospel ministry. 41 nations that they highlight have, um, have laws against it. Either it's illegal to the point you'll be fined or arrested, you may go to prison, you may disappear in a re-education camp in some, in some countries. Just for doing what we're doing here today, you have a few of your friends over to worship together, that may happen. There are an additional 19 nations where it is not technically illegal, but you'll be in great danger if you practice as a Christian or if, those, uh, if people find out that you are a Christian. And so we have to recognize this. Well, what could you lose? Well, you can lose your property. In some nations, you're fined. If you do not, uh, if you don't stop worshiping Christ, some nations you're fine. In some places, your house will be burnt down. Your property will be taken. The police will not get involved in it. Uh, We saw that happening in Egypt where over and again, Christians had their property stolen and the police would do nothing about it. Why? 
Because Christians are a second-class group. They're not going to do anything to help you. You know, give up Christianity, uh, become a Muslim or whatever it may be, and you'll be fine. But if you stay a Christian, don't expect the government to help you, to defend you. My friends, we see this all over the world. Your property would be at risk. That is on the, the light end of the equation. Your freedom might be lost. We can read all the time about places around the world where our brothers and sisters are arrested, put in jail for their ministry on behalf of Christ. In China, pastors that don't stay in the church, uh, the government-approved church, can be arrested. We see other nations around the world where it is illegal to evangelize. You can be arrested. Um, And like we said, there are places in the world where you may end up disappeared in a re-education camp. More than that, my friends. And by the way, that's nothing new. We saw that with Paul. How many times was Paul told, stop preaching this gospel? How many times was he imprisoned or placed in jail for his ministry? But the biggest threat we know is the loss of life. Our life, our family's life, people we care about, our friends, that is the biggest threat. And that's a threat faced by our brothers and sisters around the world. And it's been faced for the last 2,000 years. It could cost you everything to follow Jesus. That's why he said, count the cost. Count the cost. It could cost you everything to follow. And so, my friends, we need to recognize that. That's what makes persecution a test of faith. I remember reading years ago, and I I cannot remember where I read it, but it was the testimony of a person who had been a Christian in the Soviet Union. And he talked about coming to the West and how strange it was because in the West, you had people that claimed Christianity that weren't very devoted, right? They, they seemed to be a Christian in name only. There didn't seem to be any depth to their relationship with Christ. And he remembered marveling how strange that was because he said in the Soviet Union, you didn't find that. If you were going to be a Christian, you're devoted. You're all in because uh, the KGB could raid your meeting. And you're going to disappear to some prison somewhere if you're not uh, executed somewhere. The same thing in North Korea. If you're going to be a Christian in North Korea, you recognize what it means. They don't even have to put you on trial. We've read these reports. If you don't get Voice of the Martyrs, you ought to subscribe to it and read about these things. If they find a Bible in your home, they have the authorization of the government to just take you out back and shoot you in the head. And my friends, we need to recognize our brothers and sisters face these sorts of challenges. And so again, this idea of kind of a uh, a wavering Christianity, a, the kind of Christianity that uh, people aren't that committed to is something that you find only in places where it doesn't cost you anything to be a Christian. In fact, you might gain something from being a Christian in this world, like respectability. Those are things that used to be the case. If you're a businessman, you better go to church, right? Uh, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Now it doesn't hurt your business not to go to church. We're in a very different environment. But again, that kind of Christianity falls away very quickly when persecution comes. And so we need to recognize that. Now, this isn't to say that in the um, persecuted world they have perfect theology, but it is to say that they know what they're willing to suffer for Christ. They're convinced that He is Lord. They will suffer for Him if need be. And we need to recognize that. Our missionaries in many hostile lands today face those same challenges and dangers. They know what they're willing to suffer for Christ. Now, isn't it interesting that all of this warning that is found in chapter 3 is born out of the Exodus story? And really, that's a story of the same sort of thing. I mean, we read at the beginning of people who are celebrating being freed and leaving Egypt. Why would they not be? They're no longer slaves. And if you remember the story, they're given a whole lot of wealth on the way out the door. Gold and jewels, all these fantastic things they're given on the way out. They're celebrating what a great God our God is. He's delivered us from slavery. He set us free. But it doesn't quite stay that way, does it? Why? The risk of loss comes into the picture. The risk of loss comes into the picture. You may remember it worded things like this. Did God really drag us out of Egypt into the wilderness to die? Isn't it better to go back and be slaves in Egypt than to die here in the desert? Isn't it better to compromise We won't have the risk of loss that way. Again, the entire warning here 
is of a people who fear loss, who don't have a confidence in God. Isn't it better to be back in slavery where our lives weren't threatened in the same way? Yes, we had to obey the rules and that sort of thing. But if we did, we would be safe. As soon as their lives are threatened, they complain and rebel. Now, what's the root of all that? They don't trust God. If you want to get to the heart of what Hebrews is arguing, the reason all those things happen when they're threatened with loss is they don't truly believe. They don't truly have faith in God. They get to the Red Sea. They see Pharaoh's army advancing. They don't trust God to deliver them. Moses says, watch what God will do. They say, what can he do? Don't you see the size of the army coming against us? We have no hope. We have no hope. We will be destroyed. Again, we've looked at this recently as they came to that day of testing. And we looked at the various places that that imagery in Psalm 95 is referring to, but one of those places is when they send the spies into the land of promise and they come back and they say, nope, we can't take it. It's everything that was said. It was everything that was promised, but we cannot take it. Why? They're giants. It's an army that we can't defeat. Now, Joshua and Caleb, they have a very different view of this, don't they? They say, they may be giants, whatever. We've got God with us. God has made the promise. This is something even a harlot named Rahab understood, right? Later on, she said, I know that your God said that he would give you victory. And he has over and over again in the wilderness. Time and again, he has given you victory. And I'm convinced that if he's told you, you'll take this city, you will take this city. So I ask only this, that your God would show us mercy. If I hide you, if I help you, that your God would show us mercy. She had no question at all. So many of the children of Israel had plenty of questions. How can we know God can give us this city? The walls are too high. They're too thick. There's too many of them. We'll never do it. My friends, what these things reveal is the character of the people in the wilderness. That's what the author's saying. It's not that they created disbelief. They revealed disbelief. That's the entire point that he's trying to get to. They were not a people of faith. And it's revealed in the actions and attitudes that they showed in the wilderness. And so again, persecution and difficulty reveals these things. Reveals these things. And so my friends, there is a risk of loss and it's a great test of faith. Are they willing to suffer the loss of all things for the sake of Christ? That's what this author is asking his generation. Are you different from the wilderness generation or are you the same? The first bump in the road, and you say, we're out of here. It's not that you had faith and lost it. It revealed you never had it. That's the point he's getting at. Those who are born again have a different story. And that's really what we want to get to in our second point, the triumph of perseverance. Now, the thing that we want to look at here is what begins in verse 12, because verse 14 is building upon what is said in verses 12 and 13. Now, we're familiar with this warning. We looked at it two weeks ago. But it says, beware. This is not a light thing to be said. Beware. Put your attention on this. Recognize danger, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Now, think about that. An unbelieving evil heart. An unbelieving evil heart. Now, if that is found in you, how will it evidence itself, this author says? You'll depart from the living God. Isn't that what happened in the wilderness? As soon as those trials and difficulties came, what happened? What happened was they departed from the living God. They rebelled against Him. They wanted to leave Him. They said, we no longer want Moses. We no longer want the things God has promised us. Let us go back to Egypt. Let us go back there. And so again, this is the same warning. It may be revealed in you that you have an evil heart of unbelief because you too, like them, may depart from the living God. So what is the antidote to that? He says, exhort one another daily. We looked at that two weeks ago. Exhort one another. Encourage one another while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Now we looked at that in depth. I'm not going to go back through it except to say the author is warning you that sin will harden your heart. It will fool you. It will trick you. Luther said that it makes those things which are not good look good. It makes them appealing to us. And so again... Uh, This deceitfulness of sin which will lead you to depart from the living God. Why? It seems good to. 
Sin fools us to think it's better to go back to the synagogue and leave Christ because we'll find safety there. And safety looks awfully appealing in this moment. Now, that's what you'll do if you have an evil heart of unbelief. But notice the warning is to exhort one another that that not happen. Why? Look at verse 10. For, that word is gar in the Greek. Here's why you want to exhort one another. For we have become partakers of Christ. That means sharers in Christ. We are with Christ. If what? We got off to a good start. We left Egypt in rejoicing. We left the synagogue in rejoicing. It's not what it says. It says, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Now this goes right along with what we've been looking at for a long time in Matthew's gospel, isn't it? Right? Those who persevere till the end shall be saved. The Bible is less concerned with your beginning than your ending. Now this is not to get us confused and not understand the doctrine of justification. You are transformed in Christ the moment you put faith in Christ. But the question is, can it appear that some did that when they didn't? And the answer is yes. That's his entire illustration in the wilderness. They all left together with Moses. They all rejoiced in leaving Egypt. They all rejoiced in freedom. They all rejoiced in all that they had received, but they didn't all enter the promised land. See, they all got off to the same start, but not all of them crossed the finish line. Now, if you want to uh, see that, you can look at the end of the chapter, which we'll come to Um, over the next few weeks. He says, For who having heard rebelled? Who was it that rebelled? Indeed, was it not those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? There didn't seem to be a division between the people who left, but by the time they entered the land, there was a division, wasn't there? Because they didn't all make it. So again, they all got off to a good start, but not all of them ended well. And what's the difference? Well, he tells you here, We are partakers, sharers in Christ, if this, we hold fast the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment, because this is important. What does it mean? Well, Phillips translated it like this, if we hold the trust with which we first began. Do you have the faith you started out with? The faith when you left Egypt or when you left the synagogue Was that what appeared to be faith? Is it still remaining in you? Because the truth of the matter is we see many people, do we not, if we're honest about it, who walk down the aisle, who say, I need Jesus. I'm convinced of my need of Jesus. They come for two or three weeks. You never see them again. You hear stories later about what's going on in their life. It doesn't seem to line up with what they confessed. I mean, my friends, we need to recognize that not all who get off to a good start finish well. Now the question is, did they lose something or did they never have it? And the author of Hebrews is working on that idea. If that wasn't the case, by the way, then the parable of the sower would not be accurate, would it? Where Jesus said the good seed fell on many types of soil, but they didn't all bring forth a harvest. They didn't all bring forth a harvest. And at least two of those soils, it was troubles and trials and difficulties that caused them not to. Now, the point, I think, that we need to recognize here is this author is saying, be careful or it is revealed in you that you never had true faith to begin with. And how will we know that? Because you don't remain steadfast in what seemed to be the original confidence you had in Christ Jesus. Now let me get to this really quick because it's important to look at this word. He says, if we hold the beginning, hold the confidence that we had at the beginning, that word is hypostasis, confidence. Now, that word is used a few times uh, in this letter. It's used in chapter 1, verse 3 to speak about how Christ more or less is the image of the Father. But this is a different use of it. it. It's something different. If you were to find another place that would help us to understand how it's used here, you'd want to turn to chapter 11, verse 1. And this is a very famous uh, verse. Chapter 11, verse 1. Now, this is one we learn as children. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. 
Now, that word, substance there, is hypostasis again. So when he's talking about what it is that we're holding fast, what we had in the beginning, he's talking about this very thing, this, this substance of faith, this steadfast confidence in the promises of God. And by the way, if you have a steadfast confidence in the promises of God, does that not also mean you have a steadfast confidence in the character of God? Think about it for a moment. What confidence could you have in His promises if His character is not sound? If God is a liar, whatever He promises you doesn't matter. It's because you know the character of God that you're convinced that His promises are trustworthy. There'll be a funeral tonight for Brother Kiker. There was a funeral Friday for Cole's grandfather. And there's tears, aren't there, in those times. We recognize that. The loss of someone dear to us. But at the same time, the families say, but we know where he is. We know the confidence that we have in Christ. Now, why do they have that confidence? Even in difficult times, because they trust the promises of God. A temporary valley or an extended valley, or what might seem like a permanent valley in our lives, does not shake our confidence in who God is and what He has promised us. Nowhere in the Gospels are we promised ease and comfort. That's lies the church is trying to sell today to convince people. What we are promised is that if we are His, we will be with Him forevermore. That the damnation we deserve in our sin as natural men is paid for by Christ Jesus upon the tree. And that we are reconciled to a holy and righteous God in Him. That is our confidence. We trust the promises of God that we stand in Christ, that we are partakers of Him. And that means we're an entirely new creation in Christ Jesus. No matter what popular preachers today want to tell you, we are a new creation in Christ. And that's incredibly important to what the author of Hebrews is saying. If you are a new creature in Christ you will not have an evil heart of disbelief, right? You will not turn away from Christ. You will not go back to the synagogue. In fact, this warning is structured in this way. Beware, be careful. Because again, what will it say of you if you turn back to the synagogue except that you were never with us? You were like those people in the wilderness who did not trust God, who were not a people of faith in God. You say, well, how can we be sure that's the, the correct interpretation? Well, we're going to go ahead and preview really quick what's said at the end. We looked at it a moment ago, verse 16. For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? In other words, they all started together. Now with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? He's already tied unbelief and sin together uh, in the text we just looked at. And to whom did he swear that they would never enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? Now again, we could say it's based on their actions, but listen to what he says now. So we see that they could not enter in because of what? Unbelief. Unbelief. They showed they were not a people of faith. And again, if you say, well, is that enough? Well, let's continue into chapter 4. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, he means for that generation and for us. There is still yet a promise of entering the rest of God. Let us fear, he says, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. Don't come short of this promise. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. You've heard the word of God demonstrated by the power and glory of God. They heard the word of God demonstrated by signs and wonders in the days of, of Moses. And also in the days of David, this same thing happened. You have Seen a clear demonstration of the gospel preached. But listen to this. But the word which they heard did not profit them. Why? Not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. That's not something that was undone. It was something that was never done. Their falling away revealed they never truly ever believed what was preached to them. Now, it's not hard to see that when you go back and read uh, the record of the life and ministry of Moses. The people never really have moments where they seem to persevere at all. Every little bump in the road, it's like, oh, of course, 
Of course, God is not going to do anything for us. Can we even trust Him? My friends, if you're asking that question, the answer is you don't trust Him. It doesn't mean that our faith isn't put in trial sometimes. Of course it is. But His point is, those who persevere to the end are those people who are Christ's people transformed by the Holy Spirit. Now, if you want to get into this a little bit more, Spurgeon said of this, that it's a confidence, a comfort to know uh, that faith is not a decisional thing. Faith is not something that just happens one time. Because if, if it was, it would mean it's something like, um, I've, I've heard the argument, I've heard what you've said about Jesus, I think he would be a benefit to me right now, therefore, yeah, I'm going to become a Christian. That's the way it's going to work. And Spurgeon said, if that's the case, then when your situation and circumstances change, what are you going to do? You're going to constantly reevaluate. Is this a good deal for me? Am I really getting what I want out of this Jesus thing? My friends, far too many people give their life to Jesus under terms like that. Well, the preacher's telling me I'm going to have more financial success, uh, free of sickness, all these things that they're promising me. That sounds really good to me. Why would I not give my life to Jesus? And then you lose your job, or you get cancer, or something happens to you, and you say, all of that was a lie. didn't do anything for me. I want nothing to do with any of it. I've been given my ties to the church. That's supposed to be a seed leading to a harvest in my life somewhere. My friends recognize that's not what the Bible describes as coming to Christ. But we are lost sinners who hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin. We recognize the truth that we are sinners hell-bound outside of Christ. We recognize our utter need of a mediator, of a Savior. We recognize that outside of what Christ did for us, we have no hope. And we recognize the loveliness of Christ, the perfect loveliness of Christ. What this author is trying to tell us to read between the lines is this. If that's happened to us, our circumstances aren't going to change anything. If we are a new creation in Christ, if we've come to see Christ for who He is, our mediator and our Savior, lovely above all other things, then whatever else I might lose, while I might hate to lose them, won't change my understanding of who Christ is or my relationship in Him as a partaker of Him. But again, my friends, if Christ is simply added on at the periphery, just something that'd be nice as an insurance policy or something, then it's very shakable. And with author, what this author is saying is the first bump in the road and Christ will be shaken away. Or maybe we should say you shaken away from him. Although the author would argue you never really were a partaker of him to begin with. And so again, don't miss this. We are a people who recognize that if we come... That second way, by understanding who Christ is and our need of Him, then uh, we will remain steadfast until the end as a transformed people. Ray Comfort often says it's like on a plane, you give a person a parachute. Y'all have probably heard this example before. And if you tell the person, oh, you'll want to wear this parachute, it makes the flight so much more comfortable. You're going to sit in that seat. You're going to be incredibly comfortable. You'll be so happy you've got it on. Well, they get... 30 minutes into the flight and this parachute's on their back and they say, i got to get this thing off. It isn't comfortable to wear it. We have to recognize, Jesus said, it's going to be sometimes uncomfortable to be a Christian. But he said, if you recognize that the plane might crash and you need a parachute, if that happens, then you'll say, I'm going to cling to this parachute because I need it. In the same way, he says, if we sell Christ as a great benefit to your life, more prosperity, better health, uh, more wisdom for living. Right? He does give us wisdom for living, but if it's sold as just like, uh, like Confucius right, in the Bible, right? it's like a Confucian Bible, then, my friend, sooner or later you're going to say, this isn't very comfortable. But if you recognize that Christ Jesus is our only hope, then, my friends, whatever comes, you'll cling to Him. I just want to close with three quick points that we ought to think about from this. First of all, this describes the folly of the modern church, right? Constantly trying to market Jesus. And by the way, if you think 
that they're not hiring Madison Avenue firms to help them do this, you're wrong. Right? I mean, it's this idea that we're going to convince you that what you need is Jesus. We're going to market him in such a way, and every church is trying to find their unique marketing strategy. My friends, all that is folly and loss. I can't do the work of the Holy Spirit. I can read the Word of God. I can proclaim it. But that's as far as my effort can go. I can talk to you. I can convince you. But my friends, unless the Spirit convicts you that these words are the truth and that you need them, my friends, uh, that's as far as it will go. And again, the Scriptures tell us this. The second thing I want to think about is this is a message received by those in the letter. Be careful. Be careful. You're in danger of walking away, and that will demonstrate that you were never amongst us. A testimony seen again and again in the Bible. But there's also a warning here, I think, for the American church. Because we have had it so easy. It's getting increasingly unpopular to follow Jesus. Um, you know, I've heard people talk about they thought they didn't get a job because they mentioned that they go to church. And maybe it's something like the employer just didn't want to deal with the fact that you can't work Sundays. Or maybe it's just like he doesn't like Christians, you know. And who knows where that's going to lead over time. I mean, we're seeing some trends that are um, concerning. But what does that mean? We're going to reevaluate whether or not we're Christians. We're going to say, oh, it's not popular anymore. The world doesn't like it. The world's never liked it. The world's never liked it. Jesus tells us that. The world does not love those who are bringing the light of righteousness into the world. The world loves its sinfulness. And so again, we shouldn't be surprised that we have enmity with the world. So what are we going to do? Are we going to turn away? Are we going to walk away from Christ? Because what this author is telling you is, what that would mean is, you never partook of Christ. You never had a share in Christ. My friends, we need to think about these things. One of the reasons I said I think it's important, I, we didn't intend it this way, to go through the Thessalonian epistles and then uh, through Hebrews. We didn't intend it this way, but one of the things that we thought about in it is, it may be very important for Christians to start thinking about these things. We don't know what we're facing down the road. We don't know what our children will be facing down the road. We, be better, we better be prepared for it. Thinking about knowing where we stand. Do we stand with Christ? Are we His? Are we a new creation in Christ Jesus? And if we are, my friends, then we stand fast. Because if we don't, be careful lest it reveal in you an evil heart of unbelief. My friends... These warnings are given, I believe, to the people of God, right? If you look at this text over and over again, he refers to them as brethren. He refers at the beginning of the chapter to those who are uh, partakers of the heavenly calling. This author says, I believe that you are brothers in the faith. I believe that. I believe that you are. I hope you won't prove me wrong. I hope you won't prove me wrong. My friends, those are warnings that the people of God need today. And so I pray that we'll read them prayerfully and thoughtfully and add to it faith. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, as we think about these passages, these warning passages, Father, they give us a stark reminder that there are times that your people face persecution and difficulty and that we need to know where we stand. And so, Father, I pray as we read these warnings, we wouldn't be um, overly puzzled by what they're getting at, that we would just recognize, Father, that they are warnings to your people to recognize what it would mean if we're a people who walk away, that we are called to be a steadfast people. If we are in you, we will be a steadfast people, that you've given your people the Holy Spirit who is at work in us, and so, Father, I pray that we would be a people who have confidence in whatever we face, we can stand for Jesus Christ. And as we recognize that we don't yet stand in a difficult place, help us this day to remember those brothers and sisters around the world who stand in a very difficult place. Who the things that I'm asking today that we just be thinking about, they're dealing with and have been dealing with. And they show courage and commitment and faithfulness. Father, let us learn from their example. And as we move forward through this letter, Father, I pray that we would be 
strengthened by the many examples the author of Hebrews gives, especially coming to chapter 11, and all those great men and women of the faith who stood by faith. Help us to be a people of whom it can be said, by faith they stood in difficult times. Help our brothers and sisters who are now facing those kinds of times to stand fast so that it can be said of them, by faith they stood fast. Help us, Father, to remember to pray for them daily. And Father, we just pray that their lives would be lives that would point others to Christ as we pray for our own lives. And so, Father, as we've spoken here about what the gospel is, that it's recognizing our need of Jesus Christ, that we are lost and fallen sinners, there is no righteousness in us, that we are in Adam and hell-bound, that if we recognize this morning that Christ Jesus is the only Redeemer, the only way, truth, and life, the only one through whom we can be reconciled to you. If there was a person here that recognized their need of Jesus this morning, I pray today would be the day that they would come to Jesus and trust in him. And Father, for those of us who are yours, I pray we would hear this warning that we are a people who are called to stand fast by the power of the Spirit. It's not in our own strength, but you've equipped us to stand in the day of challenge. So, Father, give us a confidence to stand for Jesus Christ, to tell others about him, to tell in whom we have promises and in whom we will one day be in glory with forevermore. Father, we thank you for Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. If you would, please stand up to sing our closing hymn, hymn 164, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, and we will sing the first verse of hymn 164. And now for our benediction, it's found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Amen. Thank you all.